All right, hey, uh, if we haven't met, my name is Josiah. Uh, I'm the pastor here in Long Prairie, and I'm just so glad you guys could be with us. If you have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 7. All right, Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It's got some crazy stuff in it. And uh, I want us to look at a reoccurring theme that we see in Revelation. All right, so today is going to be the last day in our series uh, that we've been doing that is called From Me to We. All right, so I know some of you guys kind of go between Long Prairie, Sock Center, or maybe you watch online and then and pop in. And, and we don't, sometimes we do similar things. We don't always do the same. We've been doing this series. Uh, and, and what this is about is this. Uh, the, this is our fourth week in it. Uh, we say often as a church that we are a church family expecting guests. But what does that mean? Like we say that just about every single week. All right, so how do, how do you become a church family? Does this happen just because we show up on Sunday and spend 75 minutes together? Or is there something more intentional about it than that? In the first week, we talked about how it takes us intentionally and actively sharing our lives with other people. That, that's what it's going to take to be a church family. All right, outside of just Sunday mornings, uh, we, we need to be getting together. We need to be spending time together. We need to be sharing our mountaintop victories that we have. And we need to be sharing our valley lows that we have. Like, this is what makes you a family. In the second week, we looked at how families have conflict. And a church family is no exception. Uh, and it is vitally important that we as Christians know how to handle conflict in a healthy way that glorifies God. Because we would love to say that Christians are the best at handling conflict, and we probably should be the best, but most often we are not. We handle things in the same way that the rest of the world does. And then last week, we looked at what are our roles in this family. If I'm part of a family, you know, growing up, everybody in the family, they have a role. Like, as you're a little kid, maybe your role is um, just to put your toys away. As you get older, you get handed a few more chores, a few more things that you're doing, that you're responsible for. And these roles and that responsibility is part of being a family. And what's amazing is it's not just about uh, doing chores. It's not just about showing up on a Sunday morning and, and just filling a spot as a greeter or as someone in the nursery. It's so much more than that. When you are handed responsibility, it actually helps you mature. That's what we see with little kids, and it's the same thing for Christians as we serve in the body of Christ. The more responsibilities and roles we take on, the more spiritually mature we are going to become. And the more mature you become, the more roles and responsibility you are given. And it just keeps working this way, and, and so our job is together. Which brings us to today. Uh, and all these things that we've talked about, they are crucial for us to understand um, and for us to be able to move forward as a church family. Without these things, a church is just a social club. Uh, it's a place to get together. Without these things, churches start uh, fights and they cause stress in people's lives. Without understanding how to be a healthy family, the church will just be a select few people who have their own little kingdoms that they care about and they just care about themselves. And maybe you've been in a church that is like that. Or you walk in and everybody has their own little kingdom and don't you dare touch what they're doing. And, and it's just kind of this unhealthy thing. So these weeks have been an important foundation for us to build on. But today we aren't looking at what we're building on uh, or what we need to be doing. Instead, we'll be more focused on where we are moving towards. All right, so today matters. I want us to begin to look at where God is leading us, where we as a church family need to be going. Uh, and parts of this, I think, could be hard for some of us. Uh, you might think that this is interesting and not really sure what that's going to look like. Uh, I don't know, but our job is to listen to God and to follow his leading. Uh, and through this series, I've kind of said, like, we've just each week been like, God, what do, you, what do you want for our church family? And I believe that this week, the last week in this series, uh, is where God has been leading my heart, and, and I'm just excited about this. So uh, let's just be ready for God, uh, hopefully just to kind of bring us together again as a church family uh, and kind of move forward here. So if, if you're willing and you're able, would you stand across the room as we just kind of read from our passage today? Uh, we are in Revelation chapter 7 uh, in verse 9, all right? Verse 9. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God 
who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. God, I pray this morning, Lord, that uh, through this time that we would grow closer together. Lord, whether we've called this church our home uh, for years or decades or whether this is our first time walking through the doors, God, that we would just kind of find a way to be bound together a little more uh, spiritually this morning where we just truly feel like we are a church family. God, we ask that in your name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Uh, I want us to do something here today as, as you're kind of sitting in your spot where you're at. Um, I want everyone to take a moment and in your mind, I want you to picture something. Okay, so if you're the type of person where you need to close your eyes in order to picture something, go ahead. You can close your eyes uh, if you get distracted or, or maybe it's easier to keep them open. But I want us to do this. Um, I want you to picture, this is going to sound really basic and simple, I want you to picture a Christian. All right, so in your mind, in your mind right now, I want you to actually like picture a person. All right, and I want you to start thinking about this. All right, the, the, what is the poster child of Christianity? So start thinking about this. What does this person look like? What are they wearing? Uh, maybe where, uh, where they're going further and kind of uh, everything in their life. What are they focusing on? What are they trying to grow in? All right, all the way down to maybe what type of bumper stickers are on their car. You know, like what, whatever this would be. Think of like kind of this poster child Christian. All right, so do we have this in our head? All right, well, I, I want to share some statistics with you this morning. If your eyes are closed, you can open them. Keep that thought in your mind, though, as we move forward here, okay? Uh, there are a little over 2 billion people in the world today who say that they are Christian. All right, this is the largest religious group in the world. Uh, of those 2 billion Christians, I want to give us a breakdown of kind of where they live, uh, but I'm going to give us a few different data points and not just like one snapshot. Because as you look these things up, um, first off, you'll find a lot of different statistics, but you also need to look at statistics over a span of a few years so you can see what's happening. All right, so in 2012, when we look at the different continents, Europe has the most Christians with 530 million. Latin America had 510 million. Africa had 309. Asia had 300 million. All right, but the people doing this research, they said that by 2025, Africa and Latin America will be close together for having the most. They will be competing for who has the most Christians on their continent. Uh, and actually by 2050, Africa will by far have the most Christians. All right, now even in this statistic, I think that sometimes this can be a little misleading. Because it says like Europe has the most with 530 million. All right, well in a lot of these statistics, you need to stop and say, well what is a Christian? Uh, because in most of them, it would say that in America, that our country, uh, that 79.5% of America is Christian. All right, can we all just stop and, and agree that four out of five people that we know are not living their life with Jesus as the Lord and Savior, truly wanting to grow and accomplish his will, right? Like, so obviously there are some people in here that are just, they're Christian by name. And I think that's a lot of Europe in that. Um, but it, it was amazing as you kind of keep looking at these things. I was looking at another study. It was a little bit newer. This was 2015. And it showed the top 10 countries with the highest Christian population. Uh, and then it fast forwarded and gave a projection for 2060. All right, so in, in 2015 uh, to 2060, Russia, China, and Germany were all in the top 10 in 2050, or 2015, sorry, all in the top 10, and then they were replaced by 2060 by three different African countries. In 2060, six out of the top 10 countries, over half of the countries, um, for, were in the top 10 uh, from Africa. Six out of the top 10 were countries from Africa. Like, so we can begin to see this shift that is kind of happening. Uh, Christianity is moving from being a primarily Western and white religion, you know, kind of Europe and America, to more of a Southern Hemisphere, non-white, Africa, Latin America religion. All right, and we talked about this a few months ago, even in our denomination, in the Assemblies of God. There are uh, roughly 69 million people that are part of this worldwide, but only three and a half million of those are in America. Like, this, this is a worldwide thing. All right, so Africa will be the heart of Christianity. 
It is already moving there. In fact, uh, the poster child of Christianity, the person that you know, we are kind of like picturing in our minds, if we really wanted to picture that, uh, this is what that person would really actually look like. We should, yeah. Like the poster child of Christianity. Philip Jenkins, the author of the next Christian Jum, he said this, as Christianity moves to the global south, Christianity is also entering a world that is very poor. If you want to think of the average Christian in the world today, then think perhaps of a woman living in a village in Nigeria or in a favela, a shanty town in Brazil. Probably somebody who, by typical American standards, is inconceivably poor. This is your average Christian in the world. So a few moments ago, we read a scripture out of the book of Revelation. All right, in each book of the Bible, it has a genre uh, that it kind of falls into. I'm not sure if you knew this. Revelation falls into what is called apocalyptic writing. It's prophetic writing. It's kind of looking towards the future. Now, I think we have some modern-day baggage with the word apocalyptic, right? Because when we say apocalyptic, what do we think of? Probably like zombie movies and the end of the world and getting a bunker and storing up ammo, right? We're like, all right, the apocalypse is coming. Let's be ready for this. Okay, you're like picking your team. You're like, all right, you can come and stay at my house. You're, you can come, but just know that we're going to push you out first. Like, you know, like this is we kind of have this idea of apocalyptic when we think of it. All right, but in, in the Bible, the word apocalypse actually just means uh, revelation in Greek. Apocalypse means revelation, thus the title of the book. Uh, but it also, that would mean like unveiling or revealing. All right, so it's not as sinister as we would normally think. Uh, so this book of the Bible, it points us towards where we are headed. It is unveiling the ending of God's plan for us. And there's tons of imagery and symbolism in this book uh, that we can easily get caught up in. But at the end of the book, it shows us how the world was supposed to be and how God is going to recreate that world. All right, that's how he wanted it created. That's where we are moving to. And as you read through this book, you see a phrase that continues to come up uh, and is obviously part of God's plan for how he wants things. I want to put a few of these up on the screen. The first one, Revelation 5, 9. Your blood has ransomed people from God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. Revelation 7, 9. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. Revelation 13, 7. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. Revelation 14, 6. Carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. All right, and I promise you, I did not talk at all with Erin about what I was talking about. When she started talking in communion today about this, I was like, all right, there you go. I know that God is in this. All right, because we did not talk about this at all. And as you read through the book of Revelation and you see the plan that God has, it is obvious that the plan for everyone is for everyone. All right, he, and he wants to make sure that it isn't missed. That this is about everybody. This is about the entire world. Because sometimes I think, um, at least for me, all right, I'm not going to say this is you, but for me, I'll read or hear verses like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, all right, and, and who did Jesus die for? For everyone. But many times we hear a word like that and we naturally in our mind when we think everyone, we kind of picture somebody or a group of people. And I know for me, it's most natural to just picture people that look like me. And very quickly, it's not that I'm purposely trying to put people out of this. It's not that in my mind I'm saying God didn't die for the rest of the world. I just very easily begin to think and focus on people that look like me that are like me. All right, I don't think I'm purposely trying to do this. I don't think anybody else that maybe would have this same reaction. But what God does here in Revelation is he is making sure that in this moment we don't accidentally do that. Right? Like and say, he could say everyone. But instead, what does he keep saying? Every nation and tribe and people and language. And when you hear that, you can't really mince that up and be like, just picture one group of people. 
And, and this has been God's plan from the beginning. From the moment that we screwed up, if you remember back, he talks to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I want to bless you. I want to bless your family. But the reason for that is I want you guys to be a blessing to all of the nations. From the beginning, he's been trying to pull everybody back together in this. And he's making sure that we don't forget that when he says everyone, it means, it means everyone. And he's painting the picture that when all of this goodness at the end of the book of Revelation happens, that we will all be together, spending eternity together, worshiping together. And I think we need this reminder because so often it's really easy to drift towards people that are like us. Towards people who talk like us, who live like us, who relax in the same way we do, who raise their kids the same way we do, who spend their money like us. Like that, that's our natural thing is to draw into people like that. And I don't think that it, this is necessarily even always a bad thing or that we're purposely doing that and trying to push people out. But when we look at God's plan, he is trying to unify his creation. All right, the entire Bible is about unifying diverse nations into one new humanity, one new kingdom, but not in a way that erases or marginalizes one culture's differences, but actually in a way that honors and glorifies how God made them and what is unique and beautiful about every human and every culture. God created us different, and through those differences, we actually we come together and we glorify him and his creation, right? Right? Like if every human race was created in God's image, uh, then in a way we almost need every human race together to accur accurately reflect his image. All right, the, this, this is so similar to how uh, God gives different gifts to people in the church. And then what are we supposed to do? We come together as a body and we use those gifts together and together we can be the body of Christ. And together we can accomplish these things. God is constantly trying to bring this together. And, and this is something that God has been putting on my heart. Uh, and I feel like he's been speaking to me over the last year, but especially over the last few months. Uh, and as I've been praying about this and listening, I think I've had a few different observations that I want to share this morning. Now I'll tell you this, these observations are very basic and very simple, okay? Okay. All right, don't, don't put a whole lot of stock into this. This is like, you're like, wow, you must have spent a lot of time on these. Okay, so observation one, let me show you. Observation one, Long Prairie is a diverse town. All right, that was not a very hard one to sit down and figure out. But seriously, when you look at the size of the town that we are and the typical ethnic makeup of towns around us, uh, Long Prairie is incredibly diverse. Now, primarily what this means is that we have a less percentage of, of our population that is white, and we have a greater percentage of our population that is Hispanic and Latino. All right, but this is much more than you would typically see in a church of, or in a town of our size. Even bump it up to 5,000, towns that are 5,000 and less. If we went around the country and looked at these towns, you would not have the makeup that we have. All right, observation number two. River of Life is not a diverse church. All right, again, this, this, I'm, not, I'm not sitting here trying to like throw these things out in our face. I'm, I'm literally, as I'm praying, I'm God, speak to me. What are some things that I need to notice in this? All right, and if we look around the room on a Sunday morning, for most of us, everyone else in the room is going to look very similar to us and has had very similar backgrounds. But for somebody who would be in the minority, they look around and, and they might not see other people that look like them. And that's a difficult thing to understand uh, if you have not ever been in that situation. All right. Uh, I remember I, I've spent time going to different churches uh, and down in the cities. I went to a church downtown and I walk in and I'm like, I am definitely in the minority here. Right. And there's just like a different feeling that, that happens in that, that I wasn't used to always feeling. All right. Here's, here's my third observation. We have an opportunity to move closer to God's end plan. Like we see in Revelation what his plan is. If God's plan is to bring together all the people of the world, people from all different cultures, backgrounds, nations, and languages, 
have them worship together, live together in community, we actually have a unique opportunity to do that right now. Many towns around our country don't have this opportunity that we have. And I think by coming together, we actually can better represent the family of God and his creation. All right, now we can't be every nation, every tribe, every language, all people. But what we could do is be more than one. And I actually think that our church is uniquely positioned to potentially be an example to the rest of our community of what unity can look like. Carrie, you can, you can come up at this time. Uh, can we just stand together in this? I, I realize that in this room, there might be a lot of different thoughts happening right now. All right, and, and here's what I want to kind of say. I'm not making any blunt statements about anything today. All right, when I look at God's word and when I read about his plan and what he wants to see happen in his church, I feel like there's a chance that we might be missing something. All right, I think we have a unique opportunity that is moving uh, right past us right now with the way that we are operating as a church. And I do not know what the answer is. All right, and I, and I don't have some big plan that I'm waiting to reveal to everybody. That's, that's not at all where I'm at. What, what I told you at the beginning is where I'm at. This has been on my heart, and I don't know what that means. And every time I pray, this keeps showing up. And every time I go around town, things keep happening. And, and I just, I don't know, I feel like there's a chance that we might be missing something here. And what I want to do today is this. I want to ask if you would just commit to praying about this with me. I'm not asking you to commit to do anything beyond that. I'm not saying, hey, right now, everybody needs to download an app and you all need to start learning a second language. I'm not saying that right now. I'm not saying that everything is about to change. We're going we're gonna to blow everything up. Nope. What I'm saying is, can we pray about this? Because when I see the family of God in Scripture, and then I see our church family, right now they don't look a ton alike. And then maybe that's just how it's going to be. I don't know, but I want to pray about it. So would you be open to asking God to help guide you personally in the same way that I'm asking God to guide me personally? And that if we all come together and do this, that God is going to guide us as a church. Now, something that I do know in this uh, is this. It is easier and more comfortable to worship with people who are like you. right? To worship in the same way you do. Who sing the songs that you sing. Who speak the language that you speak. Who share the same background and culture. That is comfortable. All right? Now, I know Aaron was talking about this. When you go on a missions trip and you are standing in a church, there's something that is slightly more uncut. It's not the same as being back home. But it's not, it's not worse. It's not better. It's this moment where I've had some of these times where I sit there and I'm like, God, is this what eternity is going to be like? Like I get to sit here and I get to, sometimes you'll hear a song that you know the song in English and they're singing it in a different language and you're like, I'm going to sing out in English right now and this is amazing to have multiple languages, multiple voices coming together. And, and it's amazing what that can do. And as you begin to open up to other cultures though, you will begin to feel less comfortable. Like, I feel like I need to say this to everybody. If you begin to pray this, if you begin to open up to other, country, uh, other cultures, you will begin to feel less comfortable, but that isn't a bad thing. All right? Remember, this is God's plan for us. This is where we are moving eventually. We just have an opportunity to say, hey, do we want to start walking down that path now? And we, we had a series a while ago talking about the kingdom of God. And how our role right now is to bring God's kingdom here and now as often as we can. So we look at what is it going to look like? It's going to look like no death, no tears, no crying, no conflict. And we have an opportunity to bring that right here and now. Well, it's also going to look like many, many different people groups coming together and lifting one voice 
even though it might be in multiple languages, lifting one voice to one God. And I think we have an opportunity to do this. Like, if this doesn't sound good to you, like, realize when you, when you walk into eternity, you do not get your own little personalized eternity where, you, where God walks up and says, hey, what can I do for you? How do you want this? Right? Like that, that's not how this works. <laughs> so I, I think that, like, this is one of those things that God, God doesn't care about what color you think the carpet should be in heaven. Like, that's not going to happen. He's not going to be like, all right, let's take a vote here. And I think that there's times where we need to realize, like, it isn't a bad thing for us to become a little less comfortable. And here's, here's why I want to say this. As you pray about this, and maybe as, as our church moves in a direction where we're praying about this and saying, God, what does this look like? There will almost guaranteed be a moment where something happens and you find yourself saying to yourself, oof, I don't, I don't know if I like that. Oh, I just... I don't know if I like how that feels. This feels a little different from what I'm used to. And what I want us to do is this. I want us to be ready for that to happen. And then I want us to remind ourselves in that moment, if I feel less comfortable right now, somebody else feels more comfortable. And that's important. Because when someone else feels more comfortable, they are going to feel more comfortable to walk closer to God to walk into a relationship with him, to express their love for him, the more comfortable you feel, the more open you're going to be. And in the end, the things, the things that we're talking about that we feel uncomfortable with, they really are just surface level things. For the most part, their preferences, their opinions, the gospel is what matters. And that, that doesn't change. The gospel is the same for every nation, for every tribe, for every person, for every language. The gospel is the same. All right, so I want us to remember this as we walk forward. You have more in common with an incredibly poor woman in Nigeria who follows Jesus than your next door neighbor who identifies with the same political party as you. I don't think we always realize that. Because Jesus is the most important piece of who we are, right? Like I usually can say that in a church and people will agree. Jesus is the most important part of who we are. But then you start taking a step further and say, okay, let's apply that to our theology and how we live. And all of a sudden we're like, oof, can I change my answer to that last question? Like Jesus is the most important part of who we are. Jesus is the greatest common denominator. More than skin color, more than cultural background, more than ethnicity, more than a political party, more than an income bracket that you fall into, Jesus is what brings us together. So we have more in common with someone who follows Jesus, but looks completely different, lives in a different place, speaks a different language, has a completely different income. We have more in common with them than someone who shares something in common in every other category. That's how important the gospel is to who we are. So what I'm asking today is this. Would you commit to praying about this? That's it. Would you commit to being open about where God may guide you? Would you commit to being open about where God may guide our church as we pray about this? And be open to what that might look like. So I want to do this. I want us to close our eyes. I want to give you 30 seconds right now for you to be honest with God. And right now, if there is something about this that you feel uneasy about, there's something about this that you're not super excited about, be honest with God right now and try and say, this is what it is. God, would you work with me on this? And with our eyes closed, how many of us in the room would say, 
I am open to praying about this and open to hearing from God about this. How many would say that? Yeah. I love it. This is what it means to be a family. God, I pray right now, Lord, for every single one of us in this room, God, for those of us that call this church our home, God, I pray that we truly would be seeking after what you want. God, that there wouldn't be any hidden agenda. God, that if we feel like something is is wrapped up into something else, if we are carrying our own thoughts, our own, our own um, things into this, Lord, that we would be able to come to you, every single one of us, no matter where we are in this, we would lay those at your feet and we would say, God, speak to me. God, encourage me in the areas that I'm getting this correct in. God, challenge me in the areas where maybe my thought process isn't the same as yours. And God, that we would truly follow your voice, not, not anything else. God, that we would, we would follow your voice. The last thing I want to do this morning, if you're in the room this morning and you feel like you have not made a commitment to follow Jesus, that you would sit here and you'd say, I, I don't really know if I'm part of God's family like you're describing it and you want to be, I want to give you an opportunity right now to make that decision and say, I want to be part of this. So if you've been feeling a pull on your heart this morning and you're trying to figure this out, what does this look like? And and you're ready to take that next step. I want to give you an opportunity. So if that's you, would you just slip your hand up? If you're watching this at a later time and that's a decision that you want to make or maybe you're here today uh, and, and you have questions about it, you want to kind of think about this, you, want, you, you, you have things that you don't understand, I would love to sit down with you. So I'd encourage you, please contact me. I'd love to sit down. Let's find a time, grab lunch, whatever that would look like and just say, all right, what, what does this mean to be part of the family of God? Let's pray together across this room as we end this morning. Um, and I just want to challenge us again. Let's, if we have stuff going on in us right now, as, as we think about this idea, about this message, let's bring that to God right now. Can we do that? God, I pray that in my heart, Lord, those areas where I feel comfortable and I struggle to step outside of that comfort zone, God, I I pray that I would remember what really matters. And what matters is the gospel. What matters is you. What matters is your kingdom coming here and now. Your will being done on earth. And God, that that realization would cause me to step outside of my comfort zone. begin to engage the world in a way where they can find you. So Lord, we just ask that for every single one of us across the room. God, we pray that you would speak to us this week. Lord, that we would hear your voice, that we would follow it, that we would step out and take action when that's what you are calling us to do. So Jesus, we ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, thank you guys for being here today. You guys are dismissed.